Hey there, uh, Dan Fitzpatrick here, StockMarketMentor.com. Now today, uh, I was on CNBC's Power Lunch, and uh, these segments are, I think I was on for four, maybe five minutes or so, and they're always kind of too short to, um, to really go into detail. So uh, today, for our premium members, uh, I recorded a 30-minute video that's kind of covered the same thing. And while it's typically, uh, like I said, for premium members behind the uh, wall, as they say, I'm just going to make it available to everybody. So um, here's today's strategy session. I uh, hope you check it out. And if you like it, um, hope that you'll give uh, Stock Market Mentor a try uh, for a trial basis. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, hey guys, uh, Dan here. And uh, I thought I'd do something a little bit different today as uh, hopefully, well, I don't know, hopefully, not hopefully, I don't care. Um, uh, you saw me or knew that I was on Power Lunch today at CNBC. It's actually the first time I've been on in uh, quite a while for um, various reasons, just all kind of business stuff. Um, but it looks like there, I'm going to be on uh, a little more often, which, you know, once every, more than once every two years is probably a little more often. Anyway, so I wanted to explain in a little more, actually a lot more detail, uh, what I was saying there, because I do think it's, I think it's, I think this is really important stuff. And we're always, you're always limited to like, you know, three or four minutes, and it could even be cut off for various reasons. So, um, you know, I try to be pithy and, and all that. Um, so let me just kind of go through these charts, and I'll tell you uh, what I think about things. Okay, as I, this is the first chart, the th things that I'm going to show you, I believe they showed all of them on uh, the segment, but this is the S&P 500 weekly chart. And in order for me to give a price target, see, I said and do believe that, you know, the bottom, I, I think we're going to at least probe the 3,000 level. Um, not, uh, you know, not tomorrow, not next week. Um, I'll show you just kind of what I'm looking at here. Let's see, log chart. Yep, okay. Um, to me... You know, this looks about right, this 3,000, and how did I get that level? Well, you can see, you know, there's this little breakout here. Okay, why is that important? Well, it was pre-COVID. It was pre-anything. Um, it was, uh, you know, before, you know, obviously before the election, so there wasn't any kind of political stuff that had to do with anything. This was just the market doing what the market's doing. And I actually kind of look at this as a normal, a normal aspect of a, of, of a bull market, you know, right up there. Nothing remarkable about this. It's all the same stuff. Long base, nice uptrend, choppy, chop, choppity, chop, 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 base, boom, moving up again. So that's all perfectly normal. And then here we get the, um, we'll just call it COVID. Um, and then all hell breaks loose. All right. So we, we know this. So I look at this from, I mean, this, I've never really seen a, a sell-off uh, this fast. Uh, this happened uh, really, really really, really fast. Um, we had a 35% correction in five weeks. Five weeks. This fell 35%. Okay, that's, that's not normal, even for climax, crescendo, puke fests. That's a huge, that's a huge sell-off. That's like Wiley e. Coyote falling off a cliff, and it takes a long time before you see the little dust cloud at the bottom. 35% in five weeks, okay? That's here. And then we get the Fed, you know, um, takes rates down massively. Uh, they, were f they were at 1.25% uh, and uh, the Fed took them down to 0.25%. So they, they knocked off an 80% of the Fed funds rate, boom, just like that, which freed up a bunch of money. And then at the same time, uh, the federal government, I don't know if this was the PPP or the 
you whatever it was but you know they started pumping a lot of money into the system too i make no uh judgment or opinion about whether that's that was a good thing or a bad thing it's always easy to be an armchair quarterback i'm not going to play uh, i'm just going to say it's a lot of money being pumped into the system because of this and the pandemic was real um you know who the hell knows what's going on um so this is an abnormal market this big huge v here that's abnormal I look at this, the ensuing rally here up into right till the end of 2021 as abnormal. And why? And you could say, well, well, Dan, it's just a trend. Why is this time different? Well, it just freaking is because of this, because of the Fed doing what it was doing and then continuing to do what it's doing, all the money coming in. This is a very, very unique, I'll call it kind of a mechanical market. This, the Fed wouldn't have been doing what it was doing. The government wouldn't have been doing what it was doing if it wasn't for this big pandemic and the big downward spike. This was breathtaking. And I'm not even talking about the other aspects of this pandemic with the lockdowns and the way that impacted people's buying habits, the way it impacted um, suppliers, meaning retailers, um, you know, the middlemen, the manufacturers, the way it impacted what they did in response to this. So there, are, and I don't need to go through them all because frankly, I don't know them all, but I know a boatload of them and so do you. There was just a lot of stuff that I'm saying is unnatural. So why is this important? Well, to me, it's important because then I look at all this. I look at, I look at, uh, hang on, let me get the right, the right tool for the right job. It's like Stanley tool works. I look at this. I look at this as like null and void. I look, I see all the pain, you know, from a psychological standpoint, I see what's going on. The further down a stock goes and the faster it gets there, the more pain it leaves behind. So this decline here, has left a lot of pain in its wake, but we're looking rear view mirror stuff here. Now I'm looking ahead and I'm saying, okay, is this really a support level? That's just a little ripple and a weird unnatural market move. How about this? No, not really. This is all part of this mess, okay? So I look at this level here as like the last normal breakout level, the type of thing that you know, you see, I remember talking about this before the whole COVID thing, that this is a continuation head and shoulder pattern. Yes, there is uh, inverse head and shoulder pattern. Yes, there is such a thing. So this was a really good move. It was a nice move off of this V that consolidated here. Boom. We expect this kind of move when it happens, when it starts. Market's doing exactly what we expected it to do. But I don't look at any of this stuff as, quote, valid when it comes to assessing where the market can go when the bubble finally pops. And it did. And that's how I get this 3,000 level. Plus the fact that, you know what, traders, they like the even numbers, you're not going to see anybody, unless they're using Fibonacci lines or, or something, you're not going to see anybody say, you know, according to my projections, uh, the bottom's going to come at uh, 3115. Like, people pick the even numbers. This is why you never want to put a stop at an even number. Like, you bought the stock at 107, you're going to put your stop at 100 bucks? No. Things they come back down and bounce all the time off of these even numbers. Well, crap, I'm not going to buy it at 110, but if it falls back to 100, then I'm in. And so your stop gets triggered right when somebody's saying, I would like to buy your stock at 100 bucks. My point being that these even numbers are meaningful to markets, particularly at significant turning points. So I'm looking at this and saying, you know, I don't think we're, I kind of don't think we're done going down. And I also kind of ticked off some, uh, some numbers where, first of all, I, I misspoke. Um, 
the Fed, when they when they ultimately started jacking up the rates, I said um, that it was, you know, that they jacked them up by like 80 percent, and and that was that was incorrect. It was it was a lot more than that. From you know, from 0.25, I think it's at it'll be at four or something like that. I don't know. It was like a 400 percent or an 800 percent increase. It was a lot. Um, you know, I don't have my uh, I don't have all my notes with me right now, but the Fed totally uh, just dropped rates to zero. And then as the market's coming down, the Fed starts um, raising rates precipitously. And the reason that the Fed is doing this is because they're trying to kill the economy. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but, you know, they've basically said there's pain. You know, we're willing, we uh, meaning them on behalf or us on behalf of them uh, are willing to accept uh, some pain. We have to go through this pain. So they're trying to kind of crush the economy. They're trying to knock markets down. They're against the markets right now. And that's not right or wrong. It just is. And so the prior two bull market or bear markets were the exact opposite. Okay. In the 2002-2003 um, bottom seeking campaign. Let me just get, I'll pull this up. Okay, pay attention to time and price. So from top to bottom, right here. Okay, the market corrected by 50% in two and a half years. Two and a half years of declines. But by the way, during that time, there were like 20, 25 percent rallies, and that's good for us. When you, I want you to be thinking about this, during this nasty period, there were plenty of times to make money, but there was great opportunity all along the way to give it all back and then some. So if you were careful and you picked your points, and you got in, uh, you got on when the market had reached an extreme uh, oversold level, and then wrote it up and didn't expect too much, we're looking at technical levels, you did really well. You weren't exactly crushing it because of what was happening in the market, but you were making money because you simply weren't losing money on the way down. Uh, you took the trade, you got out of the trade, and then you backed off out of respect for the downtrend. So anyway, back here, it did take a 50% correction in two and a half years. Now, this is what you also need to know. The biggest sell-off happened two years into the correction. And one year after the bear market started, in other words, after the S&P fell 20% uh, from the high, it sold off 33% in four months. Now, why is that important? It's important because, you know, this whole, that whole song, the best is yet to come. You know, I think in this case, you kind of flip that on its uh, side a little bit and say, no, the worst is yet to come and it will come fast and furious at some point. We can't predict when that's going to happen, but we got to know that it will happen it all, because it always does. Okay. And then if we look ahead and we see the, you know, I say it's the housing crash, but it was really just a financial, uh, you know, the whole financial meltdown for various things. I think just the housing, pop into the housing bubble kind of started it. Watch the big short. You'll, you'll get it all. So this saw a 60% correction from the market's peak in 2007. 60% from top to bottom. It took a year and a half. It took a year and a half. Now, the current bear market that we're in, it's just a little cubby bear. It's just a little teddy bear. This thing, we're only nine months into it since the January peak. And the correction, it's about 25%. Okay, so if we turned this around right now, this would be an amazing feat of magic because it would buck the historical norms by a lot. Since um, 1900, the typical bear market has on average lasted 410 days. Okay, what's that, about 14 months, something like that. 
410 days the typical bear market has lasted. Okay, that's the bear market after it falls 20%. So officially, you know, the bear market started right here. <laughs> okay, so we've been in a bear market for all of four months. So basically only about a year to go if we're going to hit the average. You see what I mean? So, and I'm not saying that give it, give it a time, it'll go down to zero. And I'm not saying that there's not going to be great money-making opportunities along the way. There will be, and there's going to be a lot of them. But what I'm saying is if you're sitting here waiting for stocks to return to normal and for the bear, for the bear market to end and the bull market resume, it's going to take a while. And there's one key difference as well. During the dot-com bubble pop and the housing financial bubble pop, the Fed was on our side. The Fed was, was dropping rates. It was printing money. Remember good old Ben, uh, the helicopter guy? Um, printing money. This guy, this buffoon, engaged in the biggest prop trade on the history of this entire planet. And he sucked the rest of the world along with him because we have the world's reserve currency. Uh, and because of that, uh, every other currency in the world has to have some kind of relationship with the dollar that will give that currency some stability. So what the U.S. does, what the Fed does, controls what the rest of the market does. And I do find it, I'm editorializing here a moment, so please bear with me. I do find it quite ironic that Ben Bernanke has just received a Nobel Prize for handling the financial crisis. So this guy has put on the biggest experimental prop trade in the history of mankind that made him look good and set the market up for the biggest fall in history, he's holding the trophy while everybody else is holding the bag. Now, the good thing is for him is the Fed plays musical chairs. And it's real, like when Ben retired and he, you know, to accolades and, oh, Ben, you've saved the planet. You've saved us. Oh, Ben, I love your beard. Um, buff up that head. Um, you're great. Um, I thought like this guy's riding off into the sunset uh, as a hero and he's really not. He just got out early before the music stopped. And I remember Guy Adami saying on, on Fast Money at that time, he said he did not think Ben Bernanke should even be allowed to retire until he closed the biggest prop trade in the history of financial markets. And, you know, he was talking about what I'm talking about is this big, huge financial experiment based on some cheesy ass research that he did about how the depression could have been avoided if only the U.S. had printed an infinite amount of dollar bills. So this guy's all theory and he puts his theory into practice and it worked like a charm all the way up until the time that it didn't. And now is the didn't part. And so do I think this is a big deal? Yeah, I kind of do. And I've never been um, ambiguous about that. I do think it's kind of a big deal. And you may not want to hear this, and that's fine. Turn the video off. I won't mind because I don't know about it. But this is a big deal that we're dealing with. The Fed is against us now. Again, not a bad thing, not a good thing. It's just that's the way they are. They want to bring things down. They want to take uh, take the temperature down a bit where in the past um, they've wanted to help things out. And so it makes a difference. It should make a difference in your assessment of your trading decisions. It has to. You have to be more selective. And like I told uh, them, I said, in a way, Trading and investing is actually easier now as long as you temper your expectations, as long as you're not swinging for the fences or expecting huge returns on any given position or any given stock, you know, you're going to do fine because most stocks suck. Most stocks are crap. And that means that you're fishing in a really small pond. The one thing you want to be doing is 
you want to be only looking at stocks at the bare minimum that are above their 200 day moving averages. This is what many, many savvy large traders and money managers do. It's what I've mentioned this many times before that Paul Tudor Jones says he doesn't even see stocks that are below their 200 day moving average. He, he sets filters where he literally, they don't even come across his screen. Uh, and that means that he doesn't ever have to look at them and make a decision to do something stupid. Um, he limits what he looks at. And it's only stocks above the 200 day moving average. And that's only, that's just a, you know, that's basically a, to get in the door, you know, just a basic bottom line thing. And these are the things that you want, that we want to be looking at. Um, so it's just really important to understand that. It's also important to understand that markets anticipate the end of recessions. A lot of talk about us going into a recession in, in uh, next year. I'm not even sure what they mean if if they're they whoever they are um, if they're saying we're not in a recession now but we will be going into a recession in in 2023 I don't even understand that because the definition of a recession is two uh, consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth and that's what we've already had so uh, according to the traditional models uh, then, then we're already in a recession. And so um, for these lemmings to now be saying, oh, well, we're not really in a recession. You know, oh, it's Putin's gas hike uh, and, and all this and that. You know, look, you can, you can paint, put whatever color lipstick you want on the pig. But when you get, when you get all the lipstick wiped off, it's still a pig. So whatever reason for the two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, whatever that reason is, it doesn't negate the fact that we've had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Like, what am I freaking missing here? Somebody throw me a bone. So we're already in a recession. Now, that's not a bad, I mean, it's a bummer, but it's not really a bad thing because at least we can be honest about it. And at least we can also know that, wait a minute, markets do anticipate. They do anticipate the end of a recession. Even as the data continues to just absolutely be brutal, stocks start ticking up. Markets start moving up because that's what markets do is move. And so we need to be focused on finding the winners that are here, that are emerging. Be focused on, on making lists, you know, checking them twice and all that. Um, don't be naughty. Try to be nice. I could keep doing this all day long. Um, you know, we need to be focused on just getting a select group of stocks that we're looking at. And I actually, you know, I actually have them. Uh, not to the extent or the organization that I want, um, but that's just kind of a basic filter that I use. And so we need to be doing that uh, rather than just trade. Hey, what's everybody trading today? The most important thing, I digress just a little bit and listen to me here. I'm giving you pearls. The most important thing for you to be doing, I just mentioned it a few days ago. What's your time frame? That was in Monday's session. What is your time frame? Your trading decisions, your analysis has to match your time frame. If you're day trading, you don't need to look at market Smith and look at fundamentals. Okay? If you're, you know, investing for a long term trade and for dividends, you really don't need to look at intraday charts. Um, just do your thing. So your trading actions, your decisions need to match your time frame. And that's the one of the biggest mistakes that I think people make is they don't really have a time frame. You have to have a time frame because without it, you don't know whether you're good or bad. You don't know whether you're doing well or whether you're not. So, uh, but then getting kind of back on point, one thing, a couple stocks, they wanted my take on Apple because I had said, you know, I think Apple, you know, for people to be looking at this like, oh, this is a great stock to own. I mean, frankly, it, I would rather own some of the crap 
than own Apple. And why is that? What do I have against Apple? Nothing. I have my Apple Watch, though it is on low power right now. I have a, an iPhone. I have two uh, different iPads of varying sizes because, well, because I have the earbud thingies. Um, so I'm an, I, I'm an, I, uh, I'm an Apple guy. Um, but, you know, this thing, man, you know, at some point, the prettiest rose on the bush starts wilting. And that's really what's happening um, here. Uh, nice uptrend. Here's the 40 week or 200 day moving average. You can see all the times it's tested it, but it tested it here for a cup of coffee and then fell down. That's new. Okay. You could say that's a shot across the bow. And then this comes back up and it didn't hit this level. It actually didn't. I don't even think it hit this level and then it rolls over and then right back down here. So again, this breakdown here was a shot across the bow. Okay, so falls down here. Oh my God, Apple's done. And then it rallies back up above the 200 and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. Few noticing that the 40 week or 200 day moving average is now drifting sideways, whereas before it had been going upward. So it's flat topped now. Now, you know, we've got Felix the cat here, a couple ears, and it looking to me like we're going to start printing the right side of the face. And so I look at this type of thing, and it is literally a classic topping sequence. Also, as I mentioned, and I would qualify Apple as a leader, um, historically speaking, I think I got this from uh, Richard Jensen's. Uh, book stock market blueprints. I'm pretty sure that's the book I got it from that historically speaking the big market leaders once they break down um, have a curious way of doing this 80% of the big leaders once they break down will fall at least 50% 50% of the leaders once they break down will fall to 80% so once these big leaders start to roll over, it's kind of like, uh, I think it was Hemingway that was talking about this, uh, writing about it in one of his books, somebody going into bankruptcy, and he said, slowly at first and then all at once. And that's, I think, what we're ultimately going to be um, seeing here is you can't be looking at Apple to prop up the market. If you're saying, oh, I want to buy Apple, um, you're either in it for a short-term swing trade, which is fine, nothing wrong with that, or um, you're just kind of lazy and not really being imaginative. Apple's not going to get it done for you. Though I do like that new sport watch. Um, my wife's getting one of those. I'm kind of pouting because I don't get one. I already have one that works. Okay, and so Tesla is the other one that I was talking about where this, remember that pre-COVID level where things were still kind of normal, right? Well, that's you know, kind of here. I mean, different different time period, but it was the same type of thing where, you know, you get this sideways consolidation and then a big move up, you know, from from the 150 level, 150 level here to clear up uh, reaching 400. And, you know, there was a stock split along the way. So when we look at this type of thing, you know, it's pretty easy to see another 30% down just to reach this level and to essentially uh, form a box around this. This would be a whole new topping pattern here. Now, that I'm definitely bearish on the stock. I think that, and I'll tell you this, I've mentioned this many times before. Um, if Tesla gets any appreciable rally, I really think you want to be shorting the snot out of it. Um, but if it just continues to fall, that's really a problematic short. It's very risky because what is undeniably going to happen, as soon as we put on a short, boom, the stock's going to whipsaw. So you kind of have to wait for it um, to have it be a lower risk trade. But to me, this stock certainly has a 150 uh, handle on it, possibly a lot lower. By the way, this is a logarithmic chart. It looks like an arithmetic chart, which, which creates these real big extremes. Uh, logarithmic is actually smoother, and we still have this nasty kind of top 
going. So Tesla would be one of these stocks. Again, I'm just telling you, um, if you're looking at it to buy for anything other than a swing trade or a day trade, something like that, um, I really caution against that. This is one, it was a big monster leader and it's rolling over now. And I like Elon Musk. I think, you know, any guy that's drilling holes in the earth, um, la launching rockets into the, uh, you know, into the, the freaking stratosphere um, to spit out um, internets that Starlink satellites all over the place so that everybody, uh, including those in the Sudan and their teepees, um, if they have teepees, can, um, can get on the internet. And the guy that's like literally incredibly trying to set us up to go to Mars, I mean, you go ahead, I'll stay here. Um, you can't kind of count that guy out. And so I'm not saying that uh, this isn't an indictment on Musk. It's just a, an observation on this chart. This is a real bearish chart. So you have to be realizing that. You've got to be recognizing that, okay? So one thing, there were a couple stocks um, that I had, we just didn't add time to get to it. Um, this uh, Molina Healthcare, and I don't think this is a buy right now. Like what, just so you know, what you say on TV, what I say on TV is different than what I say here. And, well, why is that, Dan? That doesn't seem right. No, it's not that. It's just a different audience and it's a different time frame. Because when you're speaking in that venue, you know, there's money managers, there's, you know, people that don't trade and everybody in between uh, watching it. And in this case, you know, what I'm talking about here is just this trend, this big uptrend and right now, looks like we're just coming in onto the tail end of this kind of consolidation. And you can say, and you would be wise to spot this, well, Dan, this looks like a shot across the bow to me. What do you think? And I would say, well, you're right. And so this is a big deal. You got to watch for it. But as long as the stock stays above this 40-week or 200-day moving average, I think we're all good. But if you remember, you know, this is exactly um, the thing, exactly the kind of thing um, that I was talking about here in Apple. Once it broke down, that was a shot across the bow, and then it recovered. So if we see uh, Molina doing the same thing, it broke down. It recovered. 20-day, or excuse me, the 200-day or 40-week moving average is still trending higher, but this is a one to be really cautious of. And so that's why I felt like I could mention it there, uh, but not here. Another one that I mentioned several times, I was actually thinking about adding it to the active trade list today, was um, Toro, uh, lawn mowers and such. Um, I just liked, this is a weekly chart, you know, I just liked this breakout. I've, you know, I've mentioned this breakout um, last week, um, but it just, you know, it's just, I don't feel that strongly enough to say, hey, this would be a good buy because it still looks like it's a little bit early and we just, um, you know, we've just got this crossover where the 50 is now above the 200, but this is definitely one that we want to, uh, that we want to be watching. Okay. Um, all right. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, double verify today. Uh, came down to 2587, so we would be stopped out of that. Um, that's uh, you know that's unfort. Well, I should I sh I'm not going to say it's unfortunate. Uh, stocks are just going to do what they do. Uh, so we're stopped out of that. TBT is fine. What happened to Twinkie? Okay, Twinkie's doing fine. Lily, doing fine as well. Okay, so that's it. I'll see you all tomorrow.